Life coaches help people actualize personal and professional goals, supporting their clients as they navigate through all the obstacles life throws at them. Death coaches play a very different role. One that doesn't begin until after your heart stops beating. Dying is not easy, but accepting death is even harder. And that's where I come in. I work with the somewhat recently deceased, supporting them as they adjust to the afterlife. It's a difficult job, quite dangerous too, but I, I love every moment like you wouldn't believe. When you face death every day as I do, life becomes that much sweeter. Gareth was my first troublesome client. All the others to that point have been passive and eager to cross over. A shy and sensitive boy, Gareth had been beaten to death by a group of budding roughnecks itching for any reason to fight. On a sweltering summer day, Gareth stumbled upon their hangout and witnessed things he shouldn't have. He became a liability, and those low lives decided his life wasn't worth their freedom. They dumped his body unceremoniously in a thicket of thorny vines, later stumbled upon by a pair of bird watchers. Upon reaching the other side, Gareth became something else entirely. The brutality and indignity of his passing warped his mind, and Gareth transformed into the darkness that had consumed him. His spirit was vicious, a rabid dog that would attack anyone that came near. He'd possessed several young men, injured a dozen more, and terrorized the community he once called home. Almost nine years later, to the day after Gareth's murder, I arrived in a sleepy Wisconsin hamlet situated near the Illinois border. The dead can't ask for help. They don't even know they need it, the majority of the time. Death coaches are assigned to cases by supervisors, so we seek our clients out, not the other way around. Room for one, smoking, if you got it. A husky, unsmiling woman sat behind a weathered front desk, magazine in hand. She hoarsely dragged the butt of a cigarette, grinding it into an already filled ashtray. All our rooms are smoking, honey. Ain't it a delight? She laughed wryly, breaking into a mucus-filled cough. That'll be $65 a night plus tax. Great. I shouldn't be here for more than a week. I assume that won't be an issue. I replied politely. You can stay as long as your credit card keeps swiping. That's our policy. Her words echoed as I walked into the empty hallway of the motel. The rooms of the Red Cabin Inn reeked of desperation and broken dreams. Shockingly outdated decor, coupled with poor sanitation and upkeep, made it a particularly distasteful stay. Unfortunately, death coaches don't earn much, and we pay out of pocket, so I'll take what I can get. Opening my briefcase, I pinned a series of newspaper clippings and frayed photographs to a corkboard that I had mounted on the wall. Flakes of wallpaper cascaded down as I repositioned the board, ensuring I could see it perfectly from the thin, lightly stained mattress. A timeline of Gareth's life and death appeared before me. He was a lonely, bespeckled child. Couldn't find a single image of him, smiling or with friends. Gareth was raised by a single mother who looked like she'd stepped right out of American Gothic. An exceedingly modest and religious woman, she taught Gareth to deeply fear the secular world. The mugshot of the young man convicted of his murder transitioned the timeline to the next phase of Gareth's journey. His death. Of the eight boys involved in the assault, only the oldest would face serious charges, and he only got ten years. The others received lenient sentences as first-time offenders in the juvenile justice system. They were remorseless, and after being released, the younger boys used his death as a badge of honor to enhance their criminal activities. The next photo of import was a blood-spattered crime scene for young men massacred in a secluded wooded area, faces contorted in unnatural positions, puncture wounds and shattered bones indicated a long period of torture before death. Four others survived the attack, but had horribly disfigured and remained indefinitely to the mental institution. I'm not justifying his actions, but that should have been the justice Gareth's spirit needed to rest. Instead, it had quite the opposite effect. His madness only grew, and the violence steadily worsened. 
Gareth lashed out impulsively, preying on those who entered the woods at night. Rehabilitation is always possible, or so I believe, even in cases like Gareth's. Many in my industry would disagree with this mindset, arguing that spirits like Gareth are no longer deserving of redemption. I've gotten into more than one heated argument debating this issue. Their truth was impossible for me to accept, because if Gareth and those like him were beyond saving, well then, so was I. For several days, I stalked people who had known Gareth. His mother, school teachers, playground bullies, and the couple who discovered his body. At first, I watched from afar, but once I became comfortable enough, I initiated a more direct approach. Ma'am, I don't mean to be a bother, but you look like a righteous, God-fearing woman, not like the other scoundrels in this town. Would you be kind enough to help another righteous soul on his path to salvation? Laying on a southern drawl as thick as molasses, I tipped my hat to Gareth's mother. A thin smile crept across her lips. You must be a soothsayer, or maybe I'm being modest. Bethany Tillaway, pleased to meet you. She extended a gloved hand, curtsying slightly. Nathaniel Peters, and the pleasure is all mine. Only half that sentence was true. Under the guise of searching for an adequate house of worship, I asked Miss Tillaway if she'd be willing to take me to her church. She said yes without skipping a beat. I knew that she'd grown up in southern Kentucky, the daughter of a strict Baptist preacher. To ensure her cooperation, I emulated the man that she admired most. Her father. Uh, your last name sounds so familiar. You wouldn't by any chance have family in Kentucky, I asked, unassumingly, laying the bait. Oh, my. Why, yes, I do. Are you acquainted with my family? There are not many of us left these days, so I assume this was a long time ago. Her voice faltered slightly. Oh, there was a preacher named Tillaway, who I had met as a young man. He completely changed my life. I was living an unreparent life of sin before I met him. But he cast the demons out and turned me into a man of God you see before you today. Is that preacher one of your kin? Mrs. Tillaway stared at me with admiration and pride, a slight spark bubbling in her eyes. That's my daddy. I can't believe this, but you're talking about my daddy. Her voice was shaky. God is good and God is great, I exclaimed excitedly. Miss Tillaway, do you see what's happening here? God has brought us together. There's no coincidence. This is divine fate. I admittedly felt a tinge of remorse. So I was manipulating this woman through her faith and reverence for her late father. Every word out of my mouth had been carefully scripted and rehearsed down to the accent. Motives aside, I was using this woman, even if it was to save her son. May I be so bold as to ask you a question? I asked respectfully as she reached the church. I don't see why not, she answered with a hint of excitement. I'm a naturalist. I'm here for work. I studied a rare species of nocturnal insects native to the surrounding area, and I know this sounds odd, but I believe God wants you to be part of this. I don't know why, but it feels like he's commanding it. Her smile grew wider. As my daddy once said, you either walk with the righteous or you don't walk at all. I grinned in return, knowing my plan was coming together. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, meet me here at eight. I'll see you then. Garrett's mother, if nothing else, was prompt, arriving exactly at the scheduled time. A gray shawl draped over her shoulders. She shivered slightly with the cool breeze. I'd been waiting for an hour, mindlessly flipping through the Bible on a nearby park bench. Good evening, Miss Tillaway. Thank you for your timeliness. Raising from the bench, I bowed like a true southern gentleman would. Good evening to you, Mr. Peters. Shall we go? I led her to the edge of town, rambling on about biblical revelations and the hedonistic secularism of young people. I was feeding red meat to the lion. She hung on to my every word, not knowing that I'd scanned through all the sermons her father had published, regurgitating them as best I could. As we entered the woods, her mood noticeably shifted as Miss Tillaway was on edge, anxiously biting her lip. She had no way of knowing that we were headed to the site of her son's murder. It was dark, but she was clearly uncomfortable with the woods. 
Are you all right? You seem a little apprehensive. Following a mulched path, I looked at Gareth's mother with a look of contrived concern. I'm fine, I'm just cold, she replied unconvincingly. The words were deadly quiet. Miss Tillaway may not have noticed, but I was acutely aware of the deafening silence. As we neared the meadow where Gareth's life had ended, the air grew noticeably colder. Black clouds rolled in unexpectedly from the east, blanketing the clouds with their embrace. Gareth's mother stopped in her tracks as the meadow came into view. We could see the realization cross her face, the grim understanding of where I'd taken her. She turned her head towards me, eyes furrowed in anger. Who are you? Who are you really? Hatred simmered just below the surface. Miss Tilloway backed away from me. I'm a death coach, and I'm here to help your son find peace. I'm truly and sincerely sorry for lying to you, but this can't be done without you. An ominous cracking sound echoed through the woods as tendrils of thick fog wrapped around mossy bark. You're no Christian. You're a vessel of Satan. This is black devil magic, and I will have no part in it. My son is with my grandparents in heaven. How dare you say otherwise? As she raged at me, she didn't notice the fog take shape and darken, like a sculpture being molded out of a block of marble. A figure emerged. Mother? Can you hear me? A disembodied voice floated through the trees. Miss Tilloway recoiled, the color draining from her face. No, please, God, no. She was shaken, muttering to herself. Don't be afraid. This isn't a demon or black magic. It's your son. With you, here. He's as harmless as he was in life. Your presence can bring him peace. He just... Needs a little convincing. For me. Taking on a comforting tone, I caught up to Miss Tillaway. The most effective method to pacify spirits is to introduce a cherished person or object into their environment. When I was being trained, I'd seen the humanity return to even the most demented souls when this technique was employed. Confident that I'd neutralized the danger, I placed a comforting hand on Gareth's mother's back. Immediately, she pushed the hand away and began hyperventilating. You don't understand. I know it's my son. That's why I'm so frightened. Lord, help me. Do you know what you've done? A fierce wind whipped around us. Picking up dirt and dead leaves, the fog solidified and a bloodied Gareth came into view, floating just above the ground. It's good to see you, Mother. I never thought you'd come this far into the woods. I thought you knew better. Gareth broke into a devilish, toothy grin. His pupils burned red, sunk into pools of black. Ms. Tillaway bolted, fleeing as far as her chicken legs could take her. Before she'd made it even ten feet, a vine burst through the ground and wrapped tightly around her ankles. She fell roughly to the floor, her head thumping against the gravel. Where are you going? There's so much we need to talk about. Gareth oscillated between several octaves. Talk! We have nothing to talk about! You were a monster, Gareth. The whole town knew it. If they didn't kill you, you would have killed them and many more along with them. If you want me to beg to ask for forgiveness, then you're, you're out of luck. I regret nothing. In fact, I'd send you into the woods all over again if I had the chance. She was filled with poison, spitting it through parsed lips. Gareth's limbs elongated, twisting into thick, thorny vines of fog. I was what you raised me to be. All I knew was violence, torment, and abuse. But you called it love. Well, this is what your love created. With sickening speed, Gareth impaled his mother's knees. She howled in pain, blood pooling at her feet. I never loved you! Your father was a devil, and you were his seed! How could I ever love that? Despite the awful hatred she spewed, I was admittedly impressed by Miss Tillaway's defiance and strength. After the initial shock of impalement, she had quickly composed herself, a fire of her own burning behind her eyes. An entanglement of vines burst from Gareth's chest, wrapping around his mother like a horde of anacondas. 
They slithered and squeezed around her body until they swallowed her whole. I watched intently as the vines traveled back to Gareth, absorbing his mother along with them. So, this is why he's still here, I mused to myself. When I brought Miss Tillaway into the forest, I, it wasn't my intention to make her a sacrificial lamb, but fate is unavoidable. Although I wouldn't call it justice, at least not anymore. I also wouldn't call what Gareth did that night unjust either. As soon as Gareth fully absorbed his mother, muffling her tortured cries, his body began to decay. Flesh muscle detached from bone, falling to the ground before dissolving into puffs of ash. As he returned to dust, Gareth glanced briefly at me. His soul at peace, he nodded silently as he faded away with the wind. I wasn't sure how to feel. I still don't. Morality and truth are frustratingly ambiguous, and if there is a god, his ambivalence is telling. This wasn't a happy ending, but I completed my assignment nonetheless. As I typed up the summary report, I made sure to include a few strategic omissions that might keep my supervisors off my ass. Death coaches are not the judge, the jury, or the executioner. We're not the lawyers or the families in stands watching testimony between bated breaths. All we do is unlock the door to the courthouse. And what happens after that is for the universe to decide. Truly, as is life, death just isn't fair. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or watching tonight, or listening to tonight's podcast, because it's also a podcast on Spotify, or on Apple, or on Google, or anywhere else you can listen to the podcast. On a hot summer day, there's nothing better than a glass of iced tea. And thus far, you should check out my wife's tea shop, etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get numerous different types of tea, including a Mr. Creepypasta tea, the Dark and Stormy Night, which, if you ask, you can get the Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker on the front of it. And lastly, as always, I want to remind you guys, if you ever want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. And I really appreciate any time you guys can support the show, because honestly, I love you guys. <laughs> You're all awesome. So. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Haha ha, Saha, Ken Lenda Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Stephen Van Huss, Chance Burnett, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Karen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Shadow Morningstar, Mad Marshtomp, Mr. Thud, Patrick Schoolmeister, Z. Kearley, Wolfie Nums, Rafael Rodriguez, W.R. Axis, Prozac and Pancakes, Mike Bullock, Acid System, Lauren, Brian Arse, and Rumble Fox. And also a huge thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I appreciate you more than I can possibly say. So thank you guys, thank you all for listening, and sweet dreams.